Welcome to the Chasing Poker Greatness YouTube channel. Today's video is episode eight of the Strategy Combine series where Coach Brad and myself break down hands from the notes that have the highest impact on your overall winners. If you're interested in learning more about the Strategy Combine, make sure to stick around for the break. But first, here's this week's episode of Tactical Tuesday. Welcome, my friend, to another episode of Tactical Tuesday. In an effort to keep things a little bit spicier than usual, John has shown up to break down these hands completely hammered. So, John, welcome to the show. How are you doing? How's it going? That, <laughs> that's not the intro I was expecting. Uh... John is completely wasted. Just see just how well he can function being completely hammered on this week's episode of Tactical Tuesday. And hello, Mr. and, and Mrs. Chai. Hope you enjoy this episode. Um, yes, your, your son's showing up to work and he's it's just it's over. What are we going to be diving into today, John? I might do a better job today than the average episode. <laughs> uh, so we're going to be talking about big blind defense today, um, particularly facing a, um, or specifically facing a action that's, I think it has become pretty common um, in the higher stakes games uh, on Ignition and Bavada, and we'll see exactly what I'm talking about here in a second, but this hand starts out with the cutoff opening to $50, we're playing 1020, we're in the big blind with Ace, Nine of Diamonds. Easy defender, obviously, with a pretty good suited ace. And we flop pretty good as well. Ace, 10, 5, two clubs with a diamond. Um, obviously, just going to be starting out with check here. And the cutoff comes out with a pretty big um, flopsy bet. Nothing too crazy here or too unexpected here to double Broadway, two-tone flop. Um very understandable for the pre-flop laser razor to have some big C bet sizes on a board texture that is uh, generally going to be better for their range than ours. Um, but again, our hand is just too strong to fold, even facing a three-quarter spot size C bet on the flop. So not much to do here, but check call. Hold it together, John. Hold it together. All right, here we go. Gets now we face the thing the turn, that huh? I was talking about. Yeah, so we improved to a nine on the turn. Um here was going to check again. This is a, a wolf submitted hand. And the cutoff comes in with a turn over bet. So this is where I'm going to start kind of start the discussion a little bit and, and ask like what what should our strategy be versus the big bet over bet or the over bet over bet line? Because it's something that um does happen at at you know quite a high frequency, particularly on these ace high boards or these double broadway boards and single race spots. Yeah, um, it's hard, you know, it, it, it's hard when the IP villain is uh, leveraging what is presumably, you know, a decent nut advantage um, that makes it to where, you know, essentially our flush draws are going to struggle to continue, I think, facing this turn over bet um, through calling. Um, I actually think like, so if we want to get down to, you know, brass tacks with our exact hand. I would say that for me, it, it seems fairly easy. I, I would just jam uh, two pair, um, top and third. I think that villain can have a fair amount of like queen jack, king jack, king queen hands, potentially clubs, where they can barrel the turn and then kind of you know shut it down if they don't improve on the river once we call the turn and then obviously put the rest of the money in if they do improve. And so like essentially. I think this is, you know, a clever way for villains to be able to play a lot of their uh, draws fairly perfectly by generating lots of fold equity on the turn and then continuing to barrel um, the river only when they get there. Uh, so, yeah, like I think to prevent that, we probably need to be doing some jamming ourselves. Um, need to jam like ace nine, jam ace 10, jam nine, 10. And then also I think jam uh, some of our own combo draws, right? Like maybe... Um, Queen Jack of Clubs, if we have that, or seven eight of Clubs, uh, maybe even merge a little bit with like some eight nine of Clubs, um, or you know pair plus flush draw seems seems reasonable as well. Uh, but yeah, it's um, pretty dicey, and I think you know given what I just said about what I suspect villain strategy is, then I think with your Ace X's, you could just call the turn and fold to a river bet on on kind of blanks if you have like whatever ace deuce ace three ace four ace six ace seven uh those types of hands and then yeah i mean that leaves out the one portion of our strategy right which is uh 
what do we call the turn with and then call the river jam with? Um, maybe mm-hmm. like a set type pocket fives. Um, yeesh. It's going to be going to be dicey. Like maybe we don't check grays all in with like our pair plus flush draws. Maybe, you know, our pair plus flush draws we can call with and then call uh, on the river when we improved like trips or two pair. Um, and then also flushes. I think that gives us nice ability to play on flush completing rivers with both a call and a jam. So yeah, I, Anyway, I I feel like I'm rambling now, but that that would be my uh, I think the bones of my strategy. Probably gonna yeah. be doing some like call folding with hands like Ace Jack, Ace five, Ace four, Ace three, Ace Deuce. I'm um, gonna be jamming my two pairs, and you know maybe if I'm gonna like call a two pair, maybe like Ace ten, so like top two pair, uh, I could potentially get on board with calling with with top two pair. Um, or why do you like calling with top two pair better than the other two pairs? What's special about top two that um, leads you more towards calling? I just need some hands that I call the turn and call the river with is what I'm trying to like, essentially like that's, that's what I'm trying to build out is hands that I call the turn and then call the river with, because I think that's the, the hole in the strategy that I just proposed is that if we're calling the turn and then folding to the river bet, then we're probably just never calling the turn and river. Um, but again, like, I think, I think it doesn't really matter if villains aren't betting the river after we kind of pass this test on the turn. So yeah, maybe that as an exploit is the way to go. Okay. Well, I think that strategy, I mean, that is a really good counter, I think, to this overbet strategy. Um, my, I think we can maybe get into this, uh, in the second hand a little bit, but then my question would be like, if you... S- had the inclination that this overbet was um, less likely to include the higher equity part of what looks like a polarized range, right? So it's just people kind of overdoing it with the types of draws that you said are really easy to play perfectly when you start taking this line or even just some like very low equity hands just trying to take advantage of the board texture. Maybe they have um, ace-king, right? Like ace-king, ace-queen, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe they're just kind of ace-jack. Yeah, planning on checking back the river. Yeah. A lot yeah. after betting big on the turn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so anyways, Wolf here in this hand disagrees with or didn't come as, to the same as conclusions. As they do. Either. As they do. Uh, they call. They opt to just call the turn. Um, yeah. So the downside to calling with this type of hand is that you don't get to deny the equity um, from their from their draws the way that, you know, Coach Brad's check jam the turn strategy would, would, um, would have us doing. But on the flip side... You if they are the type to just barrel it off on the river, this gives us a uh, yeah. pretty comfortable hand to call all three streets. Yeah, and I'm guessing this is going to end pretty poorly for my strategy, and the, they'll jam some kind of bluff because I, I'm, I'm I'm beginning to suspect that I, I got drunkenly set up right now. Um, <laughs> we check, villain checks behind. Ho oh, ho! Thank goodness. And they have an absolute complete air ball, the king of diamonds, six of diamonds. So we learn absolutely nothing about what strategy is superior here. Actually, we do learn a little bit. They yeah. did not jam with an air ball. And I think that oh. is an important piece to the puzzle. So one one yeah. point in my, my direction. And they have like complete air balls that barrel the turn. I think that's something that's worth, you know, remembering too. It's sure. like, hey, it's not, this had, but this had a no connection with the board. And right. They just decide to put in tons of money on the flop and the turn. Yeah. It's, so clearly someone trying to take advantage of something. Yeah, so jamming like combo draws and maybe some some other flush draws is like gonna gonna perform pretty well against this villain strat. As promised in the intro, here's a closer look at the CPG Strategy Combine. The Strategy Combine is a database analysis tool that will allow you to analyze your game like a professional, identify where you're crushing and where your game needs work, compare yourself at every major node to the best players in the CPG Wolf CFP. See how you stack up versus the top players on our high stakes team. Create an improvement plan based on the specific nodes that most urgently need your attention. Focus your time and energy on the spots that matter the most. Go to chasingpokergreatness.com slash CPG strategy combine to read testimonials from the beta group as well as register yourself for the next combine. I hope to see you there. Now, back to Tactical Tuesday. Hand number two, we have a queen and nine of di- uh, good lord space. Maybe I'm the one that's drunk. Yeah, it's just the um, the button opens to $25. We defend queen nine of spades in the big blind. And we flop in open ender. So jack 10-4 with the 10 of spades. 
pretty good open ender. We check, and we face an overbet. Dag nabbit. <laughs> this guy's getting started early with the overbets. Doesn't wait till the turn and just drops it on us on the flop. Um. Yeah. Well, I mean, we could start here, I guess. Like, would you have a check raise on the flop versus a an overbet? <sighs> yes, but probably not this hand. What types of hands are you picking from? Worse ones, probably, and better ones. You know, like 7-8, perhaps. A gut shot with undercards. Um, what do you like about check raising the worst ones instead of the higher equity check raises? Because getting bet 3-bet is pretty, pretty bad for queen 9 of spades. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, right, as it is, you know, we can... We're getting a not a great price, but we can live with the price um, with our straight draw here and... Yeah, I mean, you could make an argument for just raising too, I think. I think, like, you can certainly make an argument. I, I wonder, you know, if they continue barreling on, like, a king. Um, I think an eight, they're likely to keep betting. A king, I'm not so sure uh, if they call our flop check raise. Or, I mean, if, if we call the flop and then we make our straight on the turn... King also connects with like King Jack, King 10. So maybe our draw is relatively not amazing. I mean, it's pretty good, but I could, I could, I could make an argument for check raising here and being like, okay, so I'm going to check raise versus like a polarized C bet. And I've got some equity and can keep barreling on like an eight, can keep barreling on like a spade. Um, and can just realize some fold equity on the flop. So, yeah, I, I've kind of flip-flopped. I, I think, actually, I would prefer to check-raise because I don't think the king is super great for villains, you know, for us to realize implied odds because um, the king just makes, like, king-jack and king-10 to pair. Um, if we have king-queen that doesn't three-bet pre, gives us top pair, just connects the board pretty heavily. Like, queen-jack, queen-10 are now pair plus draws. So it feels like it's going to be difficult to get uh, action from villains low equity bluffy type region on the on a uh, turn king when we make our straight yeah I, I guess like the only argument i would have against that is just what, what we saw in the last hand right like they just it's possible that they're just going crazy right and maybe they you know continue going crazy on the king but do we want them then to go crazy? i would stop myself and say well if they're going crazy on the flop then like with like king six of diamonds type hands then let's just i would just check right here and yeah we we you don't know. really want them to go crazy on like yeah, a yeah. three, right? You know, right? Yeah. So given what I saw in the last hand, if I was suspicious that the pool is just overdoing it with these big, really big flop C bets or turn C bets, then I would uh, immediately start checking check raising these types of hands on the flop. The wolf uh, in question here again disagrees with, or you know, maybe just doesn't know about the the big size on the flop in the turn yet. Um, so he starts I out mean, with it's check a tough size. To be, to be fair, it's a tough size to check raise against, like the flop over bed. It's it's hard to check raise. Like it's hard to make yourself check raise, especially when you have equity like here, and you don't want them to bet jam. Like bet, mm -hmm. getting bet jammed on is like really not super duper great. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know that they bet jam. Now that I think about it, like it's actually I'd be kind of surprised if they had like a a four bet range. A three three bet. Oh, sorry, a three bet range on the flop. Yeah, yeah. Like does top set three bet? Probably not. Um, I think they probably call and then let us bet the turn. Um, does like ace jack three bet that that hand is maybe like king queen. I don't know. Probably not. Um, does aces probably not. So. Yeah, I think actually the frequency of them bet three betting is probably pretty low, so we're pretty safe check raising here and not getting uh, bet jammed on at a super high clip. I would think. Any case, this time we decide to check call, turn some extra equity, pick up a flush draw, six of spades on the turn. So now we got jack ten, six four with two spades. We have queen and nine of spades. Yep. And assume here is going to start out with check again, and we face the second over bet on the turn. These. Were the types of hands that you were talking about jamming in hand number one, right? These combo draw type hands on the turn. So, um, is that also what you'd be going for here with the turned flush draw? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just try cool. to realize some equity. You can fall out king queen on the turn if they have king queen. 
Um, if they have ace jack, then whatever. We've got decent amount of equity. Uh, king queen, ace queen, ace king, like all those hands can maybe some random turn spades themselves are now kind of maybe like to... king jack will go over bet over bet and fold to turn raise like that's not mm. out of this world either Good question so in a rare moment on tactical tuesday the wolf actually does does the thing we train them well don't we we train them well <laughs> one we... out of every 10 actions they, they, they agree with us we nail we gin one out of every 10 and the question oh no of what does King Jack do? <laughs> oh no! Did about it. to be answered. They call all in apparently. <laughs> so, I guess King Jack doesn't fold. But it doesn't fucking matter because we make a flush. You got forty percent equity. No big deal. You got yeah, over thirty nine percent equity. What what more yeah. could we possibly want here? Um, I'd be interested in asking. The wolf to play this hand, you know, whether or not villain tanked with their king jack. Um, hmm. But yeah, how painful was this call for king jack on the turn? Yeah. That's an important data point for me because it's like, uh, <laughs> did they snap? If they snapped, I'm really, really wrong. If they tanked all the way down and, you know, kind of cry called, then some days they'll fold depending on, you know, how they feel that day. Uh, yeah. But yeah, the snap generally doesn't mean uh, they're going to be folding very much. <laughs> okay. So we got it in with 40% equity, and we got there as, I mean, basically a flip. Well played, Wolf. Good work. And by the way, I forgot to mention this earlier. You know, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, especially if you like drunken content like in today's show. Um, John, this is a good topic. Got anything else to add? Oh, I think that's going to conclude this episode, and Boom. See you back next week for more Big Blind Defense. 17 minutes. Good luck with the rest of your day. See you next week. See you next week. This is Tactical Tuesday on Chasing Poker Greatness with your hosts, Brad Wilson and John Chai. Coach Brad approved. Are you a lone wolf searching for the ultimate pack? The CPG Wolf Program is a close-knit brotherhood hell-bent on one thing only, chasing poker greatness. Powered by Bleeding Edge Wolf Strats and led by Coach Brad and his lieutenants, CPG Wolves are systematically prepared for almost any spot they'll encounter on the green felt. If you want to plug into an elite team and have a step-by-step -step game plan to realize your full poker potential, you can apply at cpgwolves.com. Space is limited, and the pack is only as strong as its weakest member. So only the hungriest, grittiest, and most driven will be accepted into the program. Applications are open at cpgwolves.com.